this committee will almost come to order. Thank you all for your patience. The Chair will now recognize the gentleman from Missouri for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I am almost ready also. Uh, let, me, let me start off with Ms. Nisbet. Uh, as the FOIA Ombudsman, Ms. Nisbet, you and your staff have done a great job in handling and disposing of hundreds of cases. As an original sponsor of the bill that created OGIS, uh, I am proud of the important work that you are doing. Uh, but your role is so critical and ultimately saves the taxpayer so much money that I want to make sure you have what you, you need. Is, is your funding and staffing su sufficient to meet your responsibilities under the law? Um, uh, thank you, Mr. Clay, for those very kind remarks. We are working hard. We have a staff of six professionals who are very dedicated and hardworking. And I think in this budgetary environment, we know that we are going to do our very best to make the most with what we have. With whatever amount you have, you are going to uh, accomplish your mission there. Yes, sir. Well, thank you for that. And, uh, Ms. Nesbitt, we, we, we have heard unsubstantiated charges of politicized politicization uh, uh, in the FOIA process at some agencies. Aren't there legitimate reasons why top agency executives and others should know about certain FOIA requests before the releases are made? And isn't this very uh, different from having appointees make release decisions? Um, Mr. Clay, I, th I think you um, sta stated that very well. We would have to agree that uh, there is a difference and uh, notice is one thing and re approval is another. Um, and I understand the committee is looking into this. Thank you for your response. And, and Mr. Bloom, you, uh, you say that the President's FOIA efforts show impact, but that some agencies have been slow to improve. Uh, these problems go back to at least the previous administration, which was a significantly less transparent and much less willing to, disclo to disclose. Uh, in fact, the previous administration changed the official presumption to withholding rather than disclosing. And thankfully, President Obama reversed that presumption back to disclosure. To what it, it was during the Clinton administration, do you think the issue is simple agency reluctance to change or a agency culture to not disclose, or, other, or are there other reasons for those agencies who have not complied with the President's clear direction? Well, how, how much time do we have here? Um, I, I, I think there are many reasons, and I think that um, it, 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 in, some, in some cases it is that there is a reluctance to disclose when there is doubt because, you know, there is a perception that there is greater consequences if you disclose something that you shouldn't. And if you don't disclose it, even though you probably should, who is going to find out? The requester? Uh, but maybe, maybe not others. So I think that there is a, there's a reluctance to disclose that is inherent. I think that there is a lack of funding. You know, Ms. Nisbet uh, answered the question about her, her funding, but the, when you look at the CBO score for her office, it was many times more. They estimated it would take her many times more, much more money for her to actually do the job uh, than, than what she actually has. And I think that that is an important factor as well. And I think that that is true for agencies as well. But I also think that the system does need to be changed so that you create more efficiencies. You know, once a request has been responded to, get those records up online, make them searchable. It, it sounds to me like statutory B3 exemptions are more problematic and responsible for more denials. Uh, is that correct? Uh, from the numbers that I saw in the studies, yes. Uh, and uh, on top of, of your good work to make the public aware of, of these buried exemptions, uh, what do you recommend we do to fix the problem? I think if this committee could take a, a hard look at these exemptions when they are proposed to make sure that 
they are absolutely necessary, that they are narrowly uh, described, that they don't cover additional information, um, make sure that the drafting is uh, narrow, make sure that they are publicly justified, and make sure that we have a chance to all weigh in. I think that that would, that, that would help. I think it ne there needs to be more awareness of what the FOIA is uh, amongst all the committees of Congress. Um, critics have accused this administration of being more secretive than previous ones. Do you find that to be accurate? I don't think it is the place of our coalition to, to try to answer that question. Okay. Thank you, and I yield back. I thank the gentleman. The Chair now recognizes the gentleman from Arizona, Mr. Gosar, Dr. Gosar, for five minutes. Yes. Um, to my panel, outside circulated memos, um, what true or real hardcore pursuits of FOIA enforcement have you seen from this administration and Department of Justice? I would like to start with Ms. Nesbitt. Um, I do know um, all FOIA professionals in the, in the government, in the executive branch agencies, um, have gotten guidance on uh, the President's memos, on uh, Attorney General Holder's memos. Um, that is not only written guidance, but um, training, FOIA training, which is regularly done not only by the Department of Justice, but by agencies as well on their FOIA responsibilities. So certainly the, the guidance and the word is getting out there, but it does take time. Okay. Dr. Gosar. Mr. McCat. Well, Dr. Gosar, as my written testimony explains in even greater detail, I think a major aspect, a critical aspect of implementation is being able to show examples, concrete examples so people at other agencies can see what actually has occurred, first and foremost in litigation, perfect opportunity for examples, and then even examples of actual discretionary disclosures that have been made under the foreseeable harm standard at particular agencies, especially if it were the Department of Justice, the lead. Uh, that is something that is a, a major part of implementation uh, that I think has been lacking. Uh, it probably will come in time. It almost has to as a matter of, uh, of good common sense. But the fact that we are here two years after the fact, even on the Holder Memorandum, and there has not been one litigation case cited, uh, despite people in the openness and government community clamoring for that, where that has taken place, is, uh, is telling. And it stands in very stark contrast with what happened and what I know firsthand happened. Uh, in the implementation of the Reno Memorandum during the Clinton administration. You know, from, uh, from your, your expertise here, I mean, it's, we've seen an unprecedented tactic uh, of choosing laws to uphold and to ignore. Arizona is a perfect example of that. I'm from Arizona, FYI. Um, do you see an ability that we could, something that we could do to have better access and, and revitalize America's access uh, to FOIAs uh, that the administration and the Department of Justice could do? Well, when, when you use the word we, Dr. Gosar, do you mean this committee first and foremost? Mm -hmm. uh, I think a very simple step this committee could take right away with respect to the Exemption 3 statutes is to focus on the roughly half of them that our academic study showed do not qualify uh, as Exemption 3 statutes to begin with. That would be an easy hit, so to speak. You could build upon the research that we did. Uh, then beyond that, what the Department of Justice could do is follow more of the model of what was done during the Clinton years to implement by example. Uh, that's, that's just a key thing that doesn't seem to be there. If each one of you had to pick an agency, which one is the worst in compliance with FOIA? Ms. Nesbitt. Dr. Gosar, that is a very tough question to ask, and I am not sure that I feel comfortable answering it. We are still looking at agencies as a new, we are very new, and we are still just uh, really beginning to implement our mission. Um, I would sure like to see us really pursue this, because this is, uh, this is very important to the American public. Mr. Metcalf, do you know? Dr. Gosar, may I just add, though, um, I'm gonna, I'm going to uh, echo what uh, Mr. Metcalf just said, and that is this committee's looking at FOIA, looking at the issues of transparency and openness are very important and really send uh, a strong message. Um, and uh, 
I, I thank you for it. Well, I'm I would also like to take it a step further because I think, um, you know, in the real world, Main Street America, when we see an example made of and we reteach an agency how to do something, that makes a stronger advantage point for everybody to follow. That is why I am asking the question. Mr. Metcalf, one word, which agency? Well, again, it is difficult to single somebody out, but I can tell you that prior to the time that I retired in January 2007, I was most disappointed by the Department of Treasury, which had plummeted precipitously prior to that. Uh, in its the quality and effectiveness of its FOIA performance, and uh, since then, I'm not sure that that has changed. Mr. Blum, I think it'll be no surprise that, that I say, that representing news media groups, that uh, depending on the issue and the, and the hot news of the time, you're going to have difficulty. Uh, over the last decade, it, it was with uh, in post 9/11 environment and two wars, uh, the Defense Department and, and other intelligence agencies were very difficult because we were. Uh, new, uh, reporters were trying to get information from them. I think now, as the attention is more turning to financial information and conflicts over access, uh, that's an area of, of concern. You know, just as a, as a quick example, to, to echo what, what these two witnesses are saying, the Defense Department is very good in the process. They, they, they don't not too much drops between the cracks, but they'll, they'll tell you no quickly. So, you know, depending on how you're asking the question, I think it's, uh, it's going to get Ms. Canterbury, real quick. I haven't looked at the numbers to give you a specific site for which agency is doing the worst. However, in our experience, we have had lots of trouble at the SEC um, that require, I think, more investigation and also the Department of Homeland Security currently. Um, uh, there are several troubling um, issues around their FOIA practices, including how they are using contractors in the process. Uh, so I would say that, but I also, if I could just for a second address your previous question about uh, things that the administration has done uh, on FOIA. I think uh, in addition to the directives, the memorandums, the guidance, uh, and the work that is being done at OGIS, the Open Government Directive has also created a sort of nascent um, open government infrastructure where FOIA has played a large role. It has been featured. The agencies, when they prepared their open government plans, many of them, uh, if not all, had some FOIA improvement component. Um, and I would say that uh, we weren't completely pleased at POGO with their initial open government plans. We were part of a review process, an independent look at those plans. but. Um, uh, we are just beginning, and I think that improvements have already been, been made not only on those plans, but uh, in the implementation of the Open Government Directive uh, and the President's Memorandum on FOIA. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Dr. Gosar. The Chair now takes pleasure in recognizing the former Chairman of the full committee for five minutes, Mr. Towns. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Let me thank you and the ranking member for um, holding this hearing because I think it's the timing is pretty good because this is Sunshine Week. So, uh, and to have this hearing on Sunshine Week is uh, very, very important. Let me begin with you, Ms. Nisbet. Uh, FOIA has nine built-in exemptions of information that cannot be disclosed under a FOIA request. Is that correct? Uh, Mr. Towns, there are nine exemptions. Um, but they do not all necessarily require that information be withheld. Some of them do allow some discretion by the agency. I will give you an example. Please do. Um, exemption 1 is national security information. If information is properly classified pursuant to the executive order on national security information, um, agency officials are not free to just uh, release it. In fact, they are prohibited from doing that, and they, um, they have to be extremely careful in the way they handle that. Um, under other exceptions, for example, Exemption 5, which incorporates certain privileges in civil discovery and typically is thought of as, a, as a, including deliberative process privilege or executive privilege, attorney work product, uh, attorney client privilege, uh, that is an exemption that the courts have long held, um, does allow uh, the government to decide um, whether or not it wants to in essentially invoke the privilege so that information, particularly after the passage of time, might be very appropriate for disclosure. It does not have to be withheld. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. 
I understand, however, that outside of FOIA, there are over 200 other exemptions of information that cannot be disclosed under FOIA that were written into the laws passed by this Congress, written into laws passed by this Congress. Is that right? Uh, I think the number of statutes that would be considered to fall within uh, Exemption 3, which incorporates other statutes, is uh, really a number that we are all not quite sure about. And um, in fact, I think that is something that this committee could look at is what those statutes are and whether or not they are properly being used. Right. I am committed to um, open government. And I am also committed to closing some of um, these exemptions, such as the one uh, Chairman Issa and I competed last Congress in the SEC uh, uh, exemption. My question is that can OGIS, your agency, track new exemptions contained in legislation before they actually become law? Can you do that? Um. I would like to say that we can. I think it's a, and, and certainly um, we would try to do that, particularly in partnership with some of the other organizations that do track those things. But my understanding from talking to uh, people who work very closely uh, with all of you on the Hill is that it's sometimes very difficult to spot those things before they go through. Um, so it really takes some vigilance for, for, from you all as well as from the executive branch. Right. Um, Mr. Bloom, let me ask you, um, uh, you made a suggestion that any new FOIA disclosure exemptions be referred to the committee for review before any new law is passed or any statute is amended. Do you agree with this suggestion? Yes, we have advocated this position for, for many years. Right. Mr. Chairman, on that note, I yield back and to say that um, uh, I really appreciate the fact that you are having this hearing. I think it is a very important hearing because we are talking about transparency and opening uh, government up. I think that um, uh, in order to do it, I think we will have to be involved in the process and we all have to work together to get to where we need to go. So I want to thank uh, you and the ranking member. Would the gentleman yield? I would be delighted to yield. Uh, Thank you for your friendship and support in the last Congress that I commit to you. Not only are we going to do it, but I have arranged with the, each of the subcommittee chairmen that they are going to hold at least one FOIA related to their portion of the government, and we will deconflict it. So we will have at least seven uh, subcommittee hearings on this. We are also forming a working group, which I am very confident you will be joining, Thank you. Uh, along with parties, some of whom are at the table today, to begin the process of fashioning FOIA reform, not just to deal with one exception, but to look at all of them that presently exist. And thanks for your leadership in the past, and I look forward to us working together throughout this Congress. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I look forward to working with you. Thank you. Uh, does the Ranking Member have any additional questions for a second? And I'll go to the page that says closing. Actually, I can wing this one. I want to thank our panel of witnesses for your testimony. Uh, I want you to know that we will remain, the record will remain open for five legislative days. If any of you need additional time uh, to respond to questions or to revise and extend things you may have said, please let the committee know and uh, the chairman and ranking member by unanimous consent will extend that to allow your information to get in. This is extremely important. I would only close by asking, are all of, all of you willing to come back again, if so invited? <laughs> Absolutely. I thank you. We stand adjourned. Thank you. Did you get the call on like that?